right, so good morning. Uh, my name is Nicolo Piaz. I'm an interventional cardiologist from Montreal, Canada. And today we'll be talking about the High Life Transcatheter Mitral Valve. Uh, and with me, we have a, a really esteemed panel of colleagues and friends. So maybe why don't we just start with the introduction? We'll start with you, Nick. Thanks. <clears throat> so uh, I'm Niklas Schofer, an uh, interventional cardiologist from Hamburg, Germany. And uh, so thanks for having me. I'm also going to be the chat master for the session. So don't hesitate to ask any questions. Thank you, Nick. I'm Wolfgang Rothbauer from Ulm. I'm Germany. I'm also an interventional cardiologist. Second German. <laughs> Uh, my name is Anan Hucek. I'm from the Medical University of Warsaw. Invasive cardiologist involved in high life for almost two years. We're still in Europe. So, yeah. <laughs> Seibel Carr um, from Thousand Oaks, California, Los Angeles, Interventional Cardiology. We move content to the US. Uh, Steve Worthley, Interventional Cardiologist from Sydney, Australia. Okay, <coughs> so we got, a, we got a nice diversity of geographies. Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to review the clinical. First, we're going to present to you what the high life concept is all about. Uh, then we'll look at the clinical data associated with high life. And really what we're here to do is to share what were the lessons learned uh, through our clinical experiences and some of the challenges uh, we've encountered and, and how we deal with those. And also to uh, discuss maybe what are the future plans with the technology. So um, why don't we start with, and Xenon, maybe you just want to make a comment about the interaction with the audience and... Of course, uh, everybody don't hesitate to, uh, uh, to ask questions. This is a new, new technology, as you all know. So every question is, is welcome. Okay, so why don't, we start, why don't we start with the uh, first uh, lecture? Wolfgang, maybe you want to start with the clinical data update. <coughs> it was introduced. So these are your disclosures, and this is our program. So let's get started. These are my disclosures, and, and then we are um, within the case. And now you see an animation of a high-life implantation procedure, and it starts through a transaortic route. You cross the aortic valve retrogradely. You put a wire around the mitral valve apparatus, and then you do, you externalize this wire, and you put over that wire in the second step then a polymer ring. You see that here right now happening. And then this is irreversibly closed. And then you have your ring in place. And then you use the transeptal route. And you put in there um, the high life valve. It's a chi leaflet valve. It's from bovine pericardium. And it's, it's 19 old frame. So you expand the outflow portion, bring it back to the analysts, and, it, and, and, and unfold the atrial portion. And that's basically giving you, I think, a pretty good impression of, 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 of how the high life procedure goes. So it's mainly three steps, and it's a valve and ring concept. So I have the pleasure today to, um, to report um, for the, um, on behalf of the principal investigators of the high life feasibility study the outcome of the first 30 patients, and I will show you um, um, one year data. So the high life study is a single arm prospective multi. Um, center non-randomized open-label study, and it evaluates um, the feasibility, the safety, and the performance of the high-life uh, transeptal mitral valve uh, replacement system in symptomatic patients with um, severe uh, mitral regurg at high surgical risk. And the primary objective of this trial was uh, feasibility, safety testing, and performance at 30 days, and, and then the secondary <coughs> objectives are long-term outcome and safety and performance of these patients. So in the study right now, it, it, it aims to recruit 50 patients and 46 are already in there, but I will report to you the first 30 patients. What's in, um, important, I think, is screening um, in, in, in doing a mitral valve replacement um, um, in, in these patients. And what you see there, screening failure comes from two sides. It's either the annulus is too big to be implanted with the valve, or you have a risk of LVOT obstruction, and this was heavily screened in that study and we tried to exclude it, and I think we will hear later on that we were able at least to, to overcome the issue of LVOT obstruction in this small study I present to you. So these are the demographics of the first 30 patients. They have a mean age of uh, 75 years. They are mostly in new functional class two and three. Their mean LV uh, ejection fraction is uh, around 40%. And um, the STS PROM um, mitral valve replacement score was calculated um, by 5.5. 5. 
And most of the patient, and I think this is something very important, um, suffered from secondary MR. It's almost 90% as you see here on the table. So this just gives you a little bit of overview of the demographics, but I, I think it's, it's just the typical population we would expect um, to have at certain risk factors in, 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 in secondary MR patients, so I will skip that. And now come to the outcome of the, uh, of the study, the primary feasibility endpoint, and, and as you can see, the technical <coughs> success rate um, uh, for implantation was 90% in, in, in the first 30 patients. Successful access delivery, retrieval of the uh, delivery system was accomplished in 28 of the 30 patients. And in two patients, the wire looping, which appears to be kind of complicated, um, failed in, 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 in these first two patients. Freedom from emergent surgery or reintervention on the mitral side um, um, occurred in 29 of the 30 patients. In one patient after successful implantation, the valve migrated um, into the ventricle and, and the patient had to be converted. And all of the patients left the cath lab alive. So and here you see now the safety outcome of the patients um, um, distributed on procedural days, um, one to 30 days, and uh, 30 days to one year and um, all death rates, so there was no procedural death, but within the first 30 days, three of the patients died, and, and later on in the one year outcome, we had 17% uh, of total mortality in this cohort. The other things, I think the conversion to surgery, I pointed out there was none uh, other patient except the one within the procedure that had to be converted and retreated on the mitral side in this cohort, so conversion rate um, to surgery. Um, was 3% in, 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 in the one year follow up. And then there was one uh, patient who needed a re intervention and an operation within day 1 to 30, and he needed an intervention on the aortic side because of uh, aortic regurg, and he, he was treated with a tarver prothesis on, on, on that side. The other issue, life threatening bleeding, we have two access sites, a venous access site and arterial access site, um, and then we observed in the study four um, 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 life threatening bleeding events, one on the arterial side, one on the venous side, one was, an, was even a neck bleed on, on, on a central uh, venous line, and one patient suffered a pericardial tamponade, and, and then this had to be trained. The other important thing I want to highlight here is, is um, the closure. Was there a need for closuring the ASD? Um, the, the system has a, a 30 French um, um, diameter. Um, and, and as you see here, um, there was no need for acute closure of the, the ASD um, on, uh, during the procedure, not during the first 30 days, but in the long run, um, four patients underwent um, ASD closure. And um, last um, thing I should show you here is the paravalvular leak rate, and, and you see that it's, it's very low. Only one patient had a, a paravalvular leak greater than um, 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 one plus, and uh, this ended up in a rate of 3%. So how does the clinical um, outcome look in these patients? And you see this for the New York Heart Association classes. So the patient went similar to a tear population to very good results and, and almost 90% of, of the patients were new functional class of one or two um, at uh, three months follow up and, and then, then they kind of re um, 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 went a little bit back uh, regarding their, their classification as you see in the one year data, but this is what we expect um, from a functional MR population. So this is very encouraging and we will see um, in a couple minutes then the echo data are corresponding to that. And I think this is my last slide. Um, what we see also in, in this patient population that it benefits very significantly. This is the KCCQ uh, score we have here for you um, um, regarding quality of life. And after three months, we see there an improvement at over 20 points um, in, in this population. So I think in the end, it will correlate maybe with the echo data which uh, Cybal Carver showed to us. Okay, thank you, uh, Wolfgang. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to hold a discussion and question period uh, after Seibel uh, discusses the echocardiographic findings associated with a high life device. But uh, I just want to put these results in perspective because these were the first 30 patients that, Rob Bau that the Wolfgang was uh, showing us. Um, these 30 patients, more than 90% were performed during the COVID period. 
And more than 90% were actually teleproctored, meaning that we were doing this over Zoom, proctor being in another geographical location. And we're dealing with a very difficult field that is transcatheter mitral valve replacement. So I, I think it's important <coughs> to put this all into perspective. So maybe, Seibel, if you can carry on with the echocardiographic findings. So uh, continuing what Nico said, first of all, I'm honored to present this on behalf of all the investigators. And Nico, we are really honored that you helped us all these cases throughout, sitting in Montreal in your pajamas. Uh, but as was a good thing, right? <laughs> so I wasn't in pajamas. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I was in something else. So we're going back to the next slide to show you the echo. So this is the interim analysis, just to get you an idea which sect these patients are. These are the patients that were performed in Europe and in Australia. And there were 46 patients, and what we are showing is the data of the 30 patients which have completed a one-year follow-up with this perspective. Excluded from this database is the early feasibility data from United States, which is going to be shown later, not now. So these are the echocardiogram outcomes of that. These are my conflicts. I'm basically so conflicted that I'm a very neutral person. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what we're talking about, the LVOD obstruction in more perspective, which is analyzed by CT. <clears throat> and you can calculate the company actually took a very uh, important conservative approach to the calculations of LVOT. Uh, and you can see the way it was calculated based on the CT analysis. But what I'm going to show you and summarize in this slide, that post procedure gradient was 1.3 millimeters of mercury with no significant LVOT acceleration of flow. And up to one year, it was 2.2. And this is very impressive because there was no cases where after the valve was deployed that we found a significant LVOT obstruction. Going back to the second analysis of the echo, so this is the data where it's completed up to one year. So we have all the data for one year and excluded this 30 and this 23. That excludes the patients who, of course, died and those patients who actually went to surgery. Excluding that, that's why we have 23 patients. What you can see that all the patients that discharged were one plus or less at MR reduction. And if you look at it at one year, it's actually traced to none versus one plus, and almost no patient, it was mild to moderate MR. So I think this is quite an impressive part. As, uh, as expected, this is a mitral valve replacement. Now, you come to, into a, the larger group. This is the, all the 46 patients. Of course, that excludes the patients who were, didn't go up till one year. You can still see the trend that even at 30 days, six months, there's still one plus or less in all patients, no one in moderate patients. Now, I want to put it into perspective the MitroClip co-op data, which is like the gold standard for functional MR as a randomized trial, where you can see over here that at six months and one year, it was actually pretty impressive, it was 90%, that there is a small percentage of patients who did become three or four plus at one year or two years, unlike the other state. If I now look at the volumetric analysis, what is impressive, you see that the left ventricle ejection fraction, there was a small reduction of ejection fraction. Just to put this in perspective, in all the clinical trials, including the COAPT, there was a slight reduction of ejection fraction. If you look at the stroke volume, what is most impressive is almost a 50% increase in stroke volume. And you can see the range between 19 and 115. And that obviously relates to the fact that there was an increase in cardiac output. The left ventricular end diastolic volumes went up slightly. And if you look at this in COAPT, there was a slight reduction over here. And the end systolic volumes also did the same. And what is impressive is the mean gradient, which you can see is around 1.3 to 2.2 at the LVOT level. <coughs> going further down in analysis is, um, actually, did I show the slide of the, uh, just going back to, uh, sorry. I'm sorry, I made a mistake in going back, uh, show this data is the mean gradient. In the 46 patients, I want to show you that the mean gradient ranged at follow-up between 4.2 to 5.3. So no patient actually had a severe gradient. Going back to the final analysis, and this, I just want to bring in the student perspective of this article that we did in circulation based on reduction of MR. And what this slide shows is <coughs> that if you reduce MR, okay. irrespective of whether you're in the medical arm or the device arm, if you had three or four plus residual MR at 30 days, you did pretty badly over follow-up. And if you had two plus or one plus at 30 days, 
irrespective of whether it was the medical arm or the device arm, you did very well. So we feel that this translates the fact that we reduced the MR significantly with an increase in stroke volume, this will translate potentially into clinical outcomes. With that, I'd like to uh, go on to the discussion. Thank you. Okay, so, um, you know, let's start at the beginning of the presentation. Wolfgang, you were presenting the clinical data uh, from a bird's eye perspective. Um, and Steve, maybe, uh, and again, if there's any questions from the audience, uh, please feel free uh, to ask. There's microphones, or we also have the chat. Um, Steve, average age 75, 75% uh, were male. 70% um, of these patients had AFib, STS score 5.5, they were pretty sick. Um, are you surprised with a one-year mortality rate of 17%? How does that compare to other transcatheter therapies, and is it off the mark, on the mark? No, good, good question, Nico. Look, I mean, and the truth of the matter is it, it feels very much on the mark. I mean, but I saw one of the questions down here is around primary versus secondary MR. I mean, a lot of these patients had, um, had functional MR. Uh, obviously, we, they couldn't be uh, prolapse or flail type patients. Uh, so, you know, often um, a number of these patients had impaired LV function. Uh, so we saw that the good results. If you look, for example, you compare to another uh, transcatheter replacement th therapy, which is Tendine. In fact, you look at the mortality if had at one year. This is actually less than that. So, um, so yeah. My, my overarching comment is, um, you know what? That's not a surprising result, uh, and not not a uh, and, and nothing to do with the technology, in my sure. view. Cyber, uh, what was the mortality in the co-op trial? So we in the medical and the device arm, it was around 18 percent, and in the medical arm, it was like 24 percent. So you can see that, of course, that is actually quite good because this actually matches that, that data. And even in the expand registry in the secondary MR group, it's almost the same. So it's actually very encouraging, which is, as you rightly mentioned, in 10 9 arm, even though it was a very early experience, uh, one-year mortality was 30%. So that was quite high. Okay. And uh, maybe, Wolfgang, um, maybe some of your comments uh, about, uh, you know, your initial, you've done uh, some of the majority of cases. Uh, what's been your clinical impression overall of the clinical results in your center? Yeah, I think um, 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 the video is pointing out that it's a completely novel type of procedure, so we have to, to, to loop with the wire um, um, around the mitral apparatus. But I think after one case and, and, and perfect imaging, and I, Nico, you worked on that, how we get perfect imaging in a cath lab, we see that we can do this step um, that that's appears kind of complicated within 30 minutes. And I think this is very decent, and the overall procedure time for high life is comparable to other transcatheter uh, procedures, so nobody has to be afraid that this can't be accomplished. Yeah. And I think you get the reward because you have a very nice structure to, to implant your valve to, and, and, and you know then the paravalvular leak is not an issue, and then this is what we learned from that study, and we have a perfect result on the mitral side, so, so I think it's worth uh, taking that step and I don't see a disadvantage right now, except the arterial access we have to, to use uh, to get in the ring. But on the other side, uh, it's, 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 it's very pleasant, and it's a very quiet procedure because mm -hmm. you can go in steps. Yeah, you know, we, uh, I have to say that probably the, look, the, the majority of cases get done probably within two or three hours. Uh, we've, we've had some difficult cases uh, that extended beyond that. We've also had some easier cases that you finished in an hour and five minutes. Um, so there is a, a range. We're still in the learning curve. Um, and, you know, when we started with MitraClip in 2003, cases were how long, Seibel? I mean, those are really long. I, mean, I can't compare. Those were like three, four hours. Some was five hours. I think my longest case was nine hours. We actually took a bathroom break between the case, but those days, <laughs> I think my key, first case with you was actually what, like a little, one hour, 30 minutes. About, yeah. Yeah, so the looping that actually That was a good is, one. Yeah, <laughs> that was, the looping was actually, what is important to say is that it's very stress-free. There's no space where you have hypotension, arrhythmias, or any stuff, right? It's only a bit uh, long to get the root, but every part is actually quite stable, the is very stable. And the deployment of the actual valve is actually the easiest step. Yeah. yeah. Um, do we have any questions from I mean, the audience? <coughs> I mean, we have one expected question, but it was, um, I think, discussed between you. How difficult it was to, is to put the ring? Uh, it was uh, discussed. So it's, the, uh, yeah. 
Yeah. So I think that to create a loop, uh, as, as uh, Seibel said and as Wolfgang said, uh, from my experience, this is uh, the, the, the slower you do it, the faster you end the, the, this part of the procedure. So it's very, you know, uh, detailed uh, uh, pre-procedural planning and we have different projections for that. And you have to do it slowly. And the slower you do it, the, the, the faster you snare it, and, and you will see it in the, in, the, in the case presentation. Okay, thank you. So, um, you know, Seibel, you had some um, interesting results uh, presented that I think we're, we're expecting with mitral valve treatment. Um, there was a, you know, this concept of a reduction in ejection fraction, whether it's clinically significant, who knows, from, you know, f three, four percentage points. Uh, but really what we saw was a dramatic increase in stroke volume. I think that's what captures my attention. And I think it's something we don't report. You know, we, we, we see these MR reductions from 4 plus to 2 plus, And, um, you know, we report mean gradients after uh, the, the valve. But what's important is, forward. one, have we increased forward stroke volume? And two, have we reduced left atrial pressure so that they don't go into pulmonary edema. There's a forward and a backward problem that we don't usually think about. So, you know, when you look at these results, how, is, how do these results sort of fit in, in with your general experience with mitral valve treatment? So <clears throat> I'm putting into reference the COAP trial. So in the COAP trial, if you look, you saw a dramatic improvement of heart failure admissions within a few weeks, right? But if you looked at the ejection fraction, the device arm, there was a 4.4 reduction of ejection fraction. And in the medical arm, it was 8.8%. So there was a reduction. But in, both the, but in the group in the mitral kebab, there was a, two changes. One was a reduction of left atrial pressure and an increase in forward cardiac output. And I think what really translates into symptoms is, as you mentioned, the reduction of left atrial pressure. Otherwise, why would the patient's heart failure improve within a right. few weeks, right? So I think it's the, not the remodeling. We do expect that the end systolic volume, and all the studies I've seen actually went up a little bit, mm -hmm. but the diastolic volumes uh, should remain constant or actually go down a little bit, I think, over time. I was gonna yeah. go quickly, the, the ejection fraction piece makes sense when you think about what's happening um, in terms of the flow. So for example, you know, with, with preserved uh, ventricular function, you have to have a slightly higher ejection fraction um, when you've got severe MR because half of your output's going into the left atrium. Right. So immediately, um, once you, you take that away, there's actually there's always going to be a slight reduction in ejection fraction, even though forward flow is going to be increased. Right, right. Okay, so uh, just to follow schedule, uh, we'll move on uh, to the uh, next uh, talk, which is, uh, Zenon, you want to go yep. ahead and <coughs> present the uh, video and yep. uh, an example of a, of a case. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, so this is the, this is the case, uh, actually our, our last case, uh, um, performed in the in the Warsaw University Hospital. Um, this is uh, case number four, as I mentioned. <clears throat> These are my conflicts of, of interest. I think this case is a nice link um, uh, showing that the, the results uh, of, of uh, high-life procedure are, are very promising and also showing the, uh, the problem, the, the potential issue of the IASD. So if we look at the patient, our patient is, a, I think, a typical high-life uh, candidate, 70-year-old uh, male with high-risk, high mitral STS score or, of 5.5. Uh, uh, he was uh, NIHA 3 before, just before the procedure. Due to the medication, he was reduced to NIHA 2. Persistent AF, COPD. <laughs> he had some limited mobility also, uh, post-right hip injury using a walking stick. And the medications, I think, were typical for, uh, for uh, heart failure. Uh, so uh, due to the high score fra frailty of the patient, the patient was um, uh, finally disqualified from surgery. Uh, from the edge-to-edge -edge part, how, uh, why, the why he was not a candidate for edge-to-edge, -edge, according to us, it was unlikely that most of the patients in the, in the high life study, as it was uh, alluded by Wolfgang, uh, the, this, this patient had a <clears throat> a primary mitral regurgitation with uh, especially posterior mitral uh, leaflet uh, prola a little bit prolaptic and uh, segmentated. So we didn't think that the uh, patient is a perfect or a good 
uh, edge to edge candidate in our center. Just a few slides on the very, very briefly how the procedure is, is, is performed. So, uh, uh, as it was shown, this is a basically two step procedure. So, we have uh, <coughs> transfemoral arterial access to place the ring and the wire around the uh, mitral, just under the mitral valve. And there is the second part, which is uh, delivering the prosthesis itself. You can see, as, as we discussed, uh, that the uh, looping, the, wire, the wiring with the uh, long teruma wire is very stepwise and it is based on the pre-procedural planning so that we are sure that we, are, uh, we uh, encompass all of the cordae um, uh, um, below the matra, uh, mitral uh, apparatus. As soon as we do that, we externalize uh, the uh, teruma wire to the ascending aorta. Then we snare it. As you can see, it's a multi-plane snare. <coughs> it's usually a, a quite a, uh, a simple, uh, a simple uh, thing to do. And once the <coughs> wire is uh, caught by the snare, uh, we do the so-called cinching procedure. So we, uh, so we check carefully in TOE and various projections, uh, if, the, if the looping is, is good, is successful. Then for a moment, we switch for the uh, venous side, uh, just to be sure before uh, putting the, the ring itself over the wire that we can puncture the septum. It's usually possible, of course, the usual puncture site is posterior inferior or to mid to mid, but it also heavily depends on the, on the pre-procedural CT. Uh, planning after we secure the transeptal axis, we put a safari wire here uh, just to have a stability of the of the system, and we proceed with the uh, with the placement of the of the uh, loop or ring, as we can call it. You can see it. Uh, you can see it on the right hand panel. This is, I think, a purely a technical uh, step of the procedure with a different catheter. And then we are ready for deploying the valve. Uh, uh, of course, uh, a septostomy is needed uh, uh, to facilitate, uh, facilitate passing of the, of the system. We usually use um, a small 10 millimeter uh, non-compliant balloon. Uh, and the prolonged low pressure inflation is, is advised in this, uh, in this situation. As you can see, you have a Landerquist wire pre-shaped stiff wire placed in the, in the apex. It's facing downwards, of course. And we, uh, this is usually uh, um, very easy to, uh, to cross uh, the uh, pre-positioned ring, as you okay. see here. And you can also see the valve here. This is the, this is the self-expanding 28 millimeters high-life uh, prosthesis. It's a two-part prosthesis, as you can see here. Um, this is the moment of the deployment, so the, uh, the passage of the valve also usually is, uh, does not pose any problems. Uh, we start with opening the uh, ventricular part, then with a certain amount of pull, uh, we uh, just approximate the ring uh, to the uh, mitral plane, and then we can open the atrial part of the prosthesis. And uh, you can appreciate the final Result, this is, uh, this is the result of the functioning high-life 28 millimeter prosthesis uh, with uh, no apparent regurgitation, as you can see in the, in the pigtail injection. But as I mentioned at the, at the beginning, uh, also the, uh, uh, there is an issue of the ASD. Uh, this is um, the, the, the valve itself is 30 French. The system uh, or delivery system is 18 French. But uh, there is some manipulation uh, over the septum, so we can expect, as with different mitral technologies, that we can have some uh, I ASD. And we actually, in this patient, we, uh, we noted just after deployment of the valve that, that there is a, um, some kind of destabilization uh, in, in the patient. There, is, there was a drop in saturation despite mechanical ventilation with 100% oxygen. And what we noticed, what our echocardiographer noticed, was a, quite a large... Uh, IASD with a tear and very importantly with the right to left shunt. So we didn't hesitate and uh, uh, given the right to left shunt, we immediately uh, proceeded um, uh, to the closure. This, was, this is a balloon sizing. I think if you are not sure if the, 
instability is due to the ASD. You can do a prolonged balloon inflation and look at the <coughs> look at the um, uh, vital signs. But we were we were sure that we have to close it, and we close it with a with a typical ASD closure device. Uh, on the right uh, hand side panel, you can see that. And this is the eco, uh, final echocardiographic effect with a <coughs> with a amplatzer sitting just uh, you know. Uh, Closely to the uh, to the high life valve, not uh, not colliding with it, and the patient actually was discharged in good condition on um, a little bit late because we had a problem with INR, uh, and this patient uh, he has improved uh, uh, walk test and uh, he's in Niha one now and there is no PVL at uh, three months. An important message from this case also, if I have some more time, is that uh, uh, compared to our first case, the total procedure time was reduced by half. As you can see, there was 22 millimeter looping, uh, nine millimeters, uh, nine minutes, excuse me, uh, snaring, 16 minutes to ring closure, and 18 minutes to full deployment of the valve. So with that, uh, I would like to. Oh no, I don't know how to go back. It's okay. With that, I, yeah, sorry. I would like to just uh, finish and uh, highlight that this is uh, a teamwork also in our um, uh, university, in our center. There are several people involved in that, imaging specialists, interventional cardiologists, and big thank to uh, Nico, uh, of course, for remote proctoring. All of the cases were remotely proctored, they beautifully prepared, and also a big thank uh, uh, to Reiner from uh, High Life for on-site technical support. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, before I go on, I also just want to thank uh, Jean Bétier, who's uh, in the crowd. Um, Jean, you can raise up your hand. He's our echocardiographer from Montreal. We work together, and he's been teleproctoring with us as well. He, he's in pajamas. He wears pajamas <laughs> during the case. Um, so, uh, look, uh, I, I think we, we got a nice example of a, a nice case, uh, also with um, you know, an ASD closure. We'll keep the ASD discussion after your talk um, and maybe some nuances around managing the atrial septum and, and maybe how the high life uh, case uh, deals with, with atrial septal defects. Uh, but let's, let's start with the, the device. We have um, uh, a two component system um, and we need a femoral arterial axis uh, and we need a femoral venous axis, so we need two axes. Um, the delivery catheter is uh, an 18 French shaft and it has a 30 French capsule. Um, and when you look at it on the table, um, you know, it looks like a TAVR device. It looks identical with one knob. That simple. Um, of course, sometimes simplicity comes with some complexity. And so it's a balance, definitely. Um, so, you know, maybe Steve, can you tell us about, you know, the. Um, steps in the valve deployment. So about coaxiality, rotational positioning, do you need any of that? And how does that go on? Yeah, look, Nico, and so to try to be succinct in that, um, and I've heard Cybul say this before, but you know, the, the delivery of the valve is one of the easiest parts, but it's easy when it goes well. Um, one of the key pieces, I'll mention this a bit again in the future, is I do think a low or an inferior puncture uh, in the atrial septum is really important. Uh, that helps ensure that you, you're not trying to come up too superior. Uh, it, it allows when you get some tension back on the system for it to stay relatively in line. And I also think it, it may help potentially reduce the size of the ASD, but it's, it's not perfect for that. Um, one of the key pieces too is maintaining um, traction on the system when you're pulling back. Uh, the issue is if you, if a little like you think about a TAVI and, uh, and an Evolute, sometimes you, you release forward as you release the valve. That's the worst thing we could do here. There is risk that the valve itself will embolize into the ventricle. So keeping that a significant amount of, of retrograde traction is important. And then releasing the atrial um, component of the stent frame very quickly, keeping that backward traction. Yeah. Um, they're, they're the key pieces. Yeah, so we don't have to be coaxial. So it's non-coaxial and non-rotational positioning. And really we use echo yeah. Uh, for uh, contact between the ring and, and the valve frame and the annulus. Um, okay. Um, any comments you had about the case, Wolfgang? 
No, I think everything was shown nicely um, because it's a quiet procedure and you go stepwise and, and, and you accomplish um, 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 the, the looping and then you put in the ring. This is pretty simple. There was a question there, so, so we are not suturing it. It, it. it just hooks itself and then it's closed. And then you have already done the transeptal puncture, so we never put in a, in a ring in a patient that, that hasn't a successful um, um, transeptal puncture. And then you deploy the valve, and I think, although it's pretty relaxed, it's a critical step because this is where the, where the patient is coming for. Um, for. And, 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 and then you end up with that result. And the ISD, uh, we have this discussion, you said that, but it's a very rare event. And I think we should, we, we should be focused on the valve and not doing this and that and that on the patient, but just getting him off the table with an excellent um, valve result. And we saw that um, this was a, a perfect result. Zinon, any, any questions yeah. that we have from the audience? Yeah, right we have, from the um, I think we have uh, one interesting question. Is question is, what is the level of TOE expertise required? Yeah, maybe Jean, you're, uh, you're there. Jean, can you explain to us, uh, maybe, you know, you, you've proctored all of these cases. What type of echocardiographic expertise do we need? Well, I think uh, uh, once you know what you're supposed to look like, anybody who is actually doing a, a tier procedure could easily do this, this procedure. Just have to understand what uh, wire position is supposed to be shown. But I think uh, once you understand the procedure, I think anybody who's doing a uh, mitral valve tier could also do this procedure from an echo standpoint. So, Jean, what type of echo views are we, are we looking at or do we typically use? So when, when we're at the loop uh, procedure, looping procedure, I think most of the time we would work with a long axis view and a biplane, uh, bicommercial views, and as well using a, a 3D uh, off as view uh, from uh, 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 the ventricle. And for valve deployment, it's pretty much the same sort of view, so nothing really complicated. Most of the time, I would say imaging is 100% possible with all these cases. Yeah, you know, I think as soon as you, you know what to look for on these echocardiographic images, we're using standard views, and um, you just have to become used to exactly what a wire looks like and what a ring looks like under I mean, the I think annulus. both the cases I did, I did them with my cardiac anesthesiologist. I didn't even have a separate day imaging person. He was doing the anesthesia and doing the tea together. Yeah. And so it wasn't actually very difficult. You, of course, were helpful. But if you've got an experience with uh, transeptal and tears, I think trans you can do this procedure. It's not Nico, I just to make a case that so much of the pre-procedure imaging and planning um, sets you up for success and it makes everything move so smoothly. <coughs> so, I mean, we've, we've touched on this, but the CT planning, understanding the, the, the one chamber, the two chamber, the three chamber, it makes things like placing the, uh, you know, the looping of the, of the wire um, and the performance of the procedure so much easier. Yeah. It's, may I add that? Yeah. Because I think this is an important question. The wire looping is done on CT planning and with the Fleur machine, so we don't use the echo there. Um, mostly we don't need it there. Um, um, you're just Fleur based, and this is how you can quickly work as an interventionalist and, 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 and be successful in looping. But then we switch over, and then, then we use the imaging for safety issues and valve deployment, and then it's a more an echo procedure. It's not a Fleur procedure any longer. Yeah, yeah. And when you, uh, the real time you need the echo is when you cinch the wire, right? That's it. Yeah. But as you said, it's a lot of pattern recognition, and Nico wants to do the whole thing by Fleur only, <laughs> and says that it should be done. And it is truly Good. pattern recognition, right? Yeah, it and is. Then the yeah. cinching part is it. I did want to mention about the septal hole and balloon. I actually don't use, I think we should be using only eight millimeter balloons. We just used an eight millimeter balloon and there was no problem in crossing the septum with the valve. It had just been, so I think that would actually reduce the chance of iatrogenic ASDs a little bit more and I don't pull too much. <coughs> yeah, but different technologies use even larger, uh, like 14. Yes, exactly. So balloon. this one I just used an eight. Yeah. Do we have any more questions from the uh, audience? I have one more question. What do you think that the LVEDV increased at one year follow-up despite such effective and uh, sustained MR reduction? Yeah, okay, so who wants to tackle this yeah, question? The question was that the, uh, why was there an increase in left ventricle and diastolic volume, correct? That was the yes, question? Yes, yes. Yeah, so um, if you do repair studies, um, um, and actually doing the largest study, the co-opt, there was a slight reduction in the end diastolic volume, but not much. Surprisingly, there's this, the symptomatic and mortality benefit was out of proportional to the echo changes. If you look at other transcatheter valve replacement, the diastolic volumes have gone up. So I'm not surprised that we didn't, but it's really a minimal change. And I have a feeling over time, 
with optimization of guideline-directed medical treatment, the end diastolic volume will also drop. You, you know, Saibal, I wonder if this, you know, 90% of the patients um, in, in these studies, um, at least high life, was, were secondary MR. Right. So I'm, I'm questioning whether or not we were having just continuous remodeling yes. of the ventricle and it's just the underlying pathology that we just can't control. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, any more questions, Inan, that are interesting? I don't think we do have any more. Okay. Right so, no. Okay. So we're actually right on time uh, for Steve. If you want to give us um, some highlights about uh, atrial septal defect closures with transcatheter mitral valve replacement. So here, what we're going to be yeah, looking, so Steve. I guess what we're going to be looking for is maybe you know how often do they occur? How do we treat them? And what are the indications or contraindications for closure? No, thank you, Nick. Exactly. So, uh, look, one of the things is that look, every patient in this, in this procedure is going to have an atrial septal defect. That's by definition in any procedure where you're, you're crossing the inner atrial septum from the right side of the heart to the left side. One of the interesting questions has been, well, you know, we saw a great case from Xenon where, you know, there's clearly right to left shunting, deoxygenation, desaturation, and so clearly a, a, an important indication for the patient being treated. It's given us pause to therefore reflect on, given that this is a 30 French device, uh, you know, how should we be assessing patients procedurally or subsequently uh, periprocedurally in the management of this interatrial septal defect? Uh, these are my disclosures. Well, one of the interesting things has been that there is some evidence uh, we've seen with edge-to-edge -edge repair, for example, with, with mitroclip. Uh, there have been some other okay. uh, transcatheter, uh, transceptal mitral valve replacement therapies too. But actually, there's a relative paucity of data that's published around how we should manage these patients. What I'm going to do is present some of the high-life data, but I'll first present you a little bit of some of the uh, what has been published or the evidence. Uh, some of this, uh, there's been a, a good review of this a few years ago from uh, David Holmes' team uh, out of Mayo. The one probably um, irrefutable indication is procedural right-to-left shunting, meaning that you've got evidence of a desaturation on the table, could be a question whether you should actually put a, a balloon and a, obstruct the atrial septal defect and, and get some evidence of improvement in saturation. But as you saw from Xenon's uh, perspective, that is, that is the one absolute indication. The other thing to mention is that the atrial septal defects that we're creating procedurally are not exactly the same as we see in the congenital form of the disease. Often these are slit-like. Um, as you've seen from the procedures, we're pulling inferiorly, and so often we're dragging through the interatrial septum. And so it does mean that just taking a dimension or size of the defect is an imperfect way of understanding what its impact is going to be. So we have mentioned down there atrial septal defect size of 8 to 10. Certainly as we're getting larger than 10, 15, uh, there is a definite perspective that this is going to be hemodynamically significant. But the next piece underneath there is, we would, I would strongly be advocating that we, before we're closing, we're, if in the absence of desaturation, we're trying to get some information of hemodynamic uh, um, impact of the size. So uh, you can do this obviously procedurally with saturation studies. What's the QPQS? More experience. Look, if it's greater than two, I think that most people would be saying that that's a good indication for closing. Uh, the question is if it's greater than 1.5, uh, well, what we would be currently suggesting is that's a patient population probably reasonable to defer and actually watch them. And I'll show you why. Um, one of the data pieces that I had back down there, you can't see it sitting underneath there, no. But right down in that, this bottom corner, hiding in behind my little bar is actually some data showing the impact from edge-to-edge uh, -edge repair patients that were treated with routine atrial septal defect closure uh, or being managed medically. There was actually no difference in terms of their symptoms. So what I'm saying to you is, yes, in the presence of right-to-left shunting, if there's a very large atrial septal defect greater than 10, Probably, but we would be looking to do QPQS assessments. Uh, if it's greater than two, yes, procedurally. 1.5 to two suggests that you follow that patient population. 
Now, from the High Life data set, uh, we've actually seen eight patients that have had an iatrogenic atrial septal defect closure performed. Uh, one, we've seen the case during the procedure, and you saw that from Xenon. Uh, there's been another during hospitalisation due to the patient having recurrent heart failure uh, in hospital. There have been five patients where that's been done between one month and one year and one patient uh, after one year. In fact, in four of those patients, they've had heart failure hospitalizations that have been felt referable to the size of that atrial septal defect uh, prior to its closure. Uh, here you can see some of the examples. Uh, this is a case uh, where we've got it in from Warsaw. You can see uh, the atrial septal defect that's been created. Yep. What you'll appreciate here, this is now left to right shunting. I uh, use the left atrium obviously being closest to the TOE probe. Here's clearly one which is a much larger defect. And you know, with these very large defects, uh, it, it's clearly gonna be fairly uh, straightforward in understanding that they're likely to, uh, to lead to uh, a, a problem with right ventricular dysfunction and, and right heart failure potentially in the future. But once again, I'm, I'm suggesting that we should be doing some hemodynamic assessment of QPQS in this patient population. Um, our Cooley's paper is probably the one largest or best. This is, I mentioned, from David Holmes's group. There's lots of different uh, pathways in this algorithm, but it, what it highlights is what I just shared with you at the start. Uh, if there is evidence of oxygen desaturation, so right to left shunting, close procedurally. In the absence of that, look to get some extra information that will help you in defining it. Importantly, not just the atrial septal defect size, but QPQS, but there are other patient factors that could be important, such as RV function, pulmonary hypertension, for example. But even in patients we defer, we should be following um, QPQS afterwards, especially if the atrial septal defect size is a little larger, uh, but you know, just watching patiently uh, is probably the right thing to do. Thanks, Nico. Okay, so we're, we have about uh, 10 to 15 minutes left to discuss uh, ASDs, and then maybe we can have the last five minutes to discuss maybe what's the future um, of the uh, High Life program. So, um, you know, ASD is, is a controversial topic. Um, it's something that is uh, starting to emerge as something more and more important. There's perhaps new devices out there, Cybel, that are being used to close uh, these defects. Uh, but, you know, Steve, as you were talking, um, I, was, uh, I was making some notes. <laughs> and I started to write direction, size, amount, and then I realized that it's actually ASD. <laughs> so, if you think about it, if you think about the criteria for closing, think about the acronym ASD. A for amount, right, your QPQS. S for size, so your 8 to 10 millimeters. And D for your direction, so right to left shunt. Um, and then you sort of summarize acute versus chronic closure. Uh, you know, if it's acute, we use hemodynamic instability, maybe deoxygenation, chronic probably present with heart failure, have an impact on TR, recurrent hospitalizations. So maybe let's, we talk always about the indications for closure, but Seibel, do you have any contraindications for an ASD closure? Are you ever concerned about closing an ASD? Not, I mean, when, in the PDA, when I do congenital ASDs in older patients, you have to be really sure they don't have severe diastolic dysfunction. That's for congenital ASDs. Right. For iatrogenics, I think, I don't have a definite uh, contraindication to a closure, excepting I have to also think what's going to happen to this patient if he needs another valve and we've mm -hmm. closed off the septum. Mm -hmm. So that's my only thought process of why I, I think twice before closing an ASD. Or appendage occlusion, maybe. Uh, appendage closure or something else. You know, like, what yeah. about in seven years you need a valve and valve? Can, can we go through... Yes, yeah, so uh, uh, if we, if device? I close it, usually you don't use the amplastic device. I usually use the gore septal occluder. And the reason why I use the gore septal occluder because it's a fabric with less metal, so you can actually go through it, the gore septal. There's a second device, I don't know how many people know about it. It's called At Heart. It's a device where. What, what is that? At Heart. How do you spell that? It's A A T H E R T. A A T? A T H E R T. And it's a Swiss -E -R -T. company. At Heart. And it's a very nice device where the. 
the device framework is is polymer and the fabric and it's just a fabric and there's now a study going on in the United States on congenital ASDs. But we've actually proposed to the company that the biggest use probably is in conditions like this for iatrogenic ASDs. Because what it does is you'll get this framework and it'll close and within a few years the framework's going to get absorbed and you're just left with fabric. And so I potentially think that a device like that would be, because there's so many different types of transcatheter mitral valve repair replacements which will probably need this, and that's where it can be possible. Yeah. So, uh, Wolfgang, you, you do a lot of mitral clips. How often do you close the ASD? And maybe what does that tell you about? Is there maybe um, a size, a French catheter size that you think is maybe in the you know, cutoff region of when we would expect more ASDs versus others? Or is, you know, would you recommend we need to bring these devices down to 29, 28, 27? Yeah, I think um, that's, that's, that's kind of difficult to answer then if it's a size issue. I don't think so. Um, it's a hemodynamic issue, and, and we saw that case. So if, if you're able, because of pulmonary hypertension, to, to, to create right-left shunting, then you have to occlude these patients. And this is our mitral clip experience is exactly going that way. These are the only patients we closed so far. How, how, what percentage of your mitral clip patients? I, I would, uh, it's a per mil, I would say. Sorry? It's, it's a per, a, a per mil. Maybe. One out of thousands. Uh, okay. Uh, 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 thousand, uh, yeah, yeah. Not, not, I rarely, I rarely close so ASDs rare for bitoclip. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so I think it's rare, and and, and we also so should be cautious here. I, I think, um, be, 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 because it might once in a while even be helpful for the uh, for the diastolic dysfunction um, to to have this little type of shunt there. So, so, so it's I think it's it's wise to to wait and and not just going into treating, 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 closing every hole because then we lose access in in, in the long run um, to the HM. Right. And also potentially, I think that, you know, you know how we discuss about tractioning the valve while deploying it? I have not, as you've seen it, I don't like to pull too much. And the reason why I don't like to pull too much, that leads to a stress on the septum, yeah. right? Of because course, as you yeah. said rightly, it's not the hole, it's the, it's the slit. It's and the, the slit manipulation. The when manipulation. you manipulate the wire. Yeah. So, because if you just left for the hole, the hole is very small it, by itself. So I think that's one thing I do. And the second is I usually, as you said, we puncture low and posterior near the edge of the fossa, not in the middle of the fossa where the septum is the thin. And if you do edge of the fossa is thick, there's again a less likely to traumatize it too much. That's why mine is yeah. slightly on the edge. I, I think that's a good point, Seibel. You know, we, there, you talk about superior inferior puncture on the transeptal or anterior and posterior. Yes. We, we go inferior. And posterior. So, yeah, that's right. We go inferior so that we get the major axis of the mitral valve, but also Seibel that we don't tear down, down as right. much on yes. the septum. And of course, we go a certain amount of posture to get some good height on, on the valve, but not too much so that we don't bang into the roof. Yes. So uh, infra posterior puncture. A quick one, Nico. Yes. In fact, we haven't mentioned it, but in theory, um, paradoxical embolization is another indication. It is odd that, in fact, because it's a very rare phenomenon in yes. these iatrogenic ASDs, in, in my, my view, but um, and more likely to be PFO associated. But it is something else that is raised as a, as a potential reason to close. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. You need to put your E in the ASD thing. I don't know where that would go <laughs> for embolization. I'll think about it. Yeah. Um, okay. Has any of you on the on the panel experienced any patients that have come? back with heart failure because of the ASD? No, I, I not had that. I had a patient going into mild shortness of breath, but that's because of his left bundle branch block, and he had to, that's a different story. But I don't think from right-sided volume overload, I didn't have any case yeah. with right-sided volume yes, overload. We've, we've had yeah. one in Perth, actually, Wen Yao's team, um, and, uh, and quite a large ASD. It's interesting, Zin, I mentioned around, and we talked a bit around size of balloon. When we first started, Nico, you'll remember, we used a 14 millimeter balloon, and, and I do think um, you know, we created larger ASDs earlier. I think that we're getting better at the size of them, but we had one with it recurrent half failure that Wen had to close. Yeah. And, and to be honest, it's quite difficult, at least from our perspective, it was um, um, to, 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 to measure the contribution of the ISD on heart failure symptoms because we treated mostly patients with severe heart failure. So they had other reasons why they came back um, to us. And I, oh, yeah. I think, again, and you pointed that out, we should measure, we should analyze, not just to go go on and, okay. and, and, and close every hole. So, right. 
So therefore, I think we, we, so we should do RV system. function, RV, mm -hmm. RV volume over Exactly. Function. We have to measure, I think, and, and then it yep. makes sense um, to say what is the ISD contributing to the hemodynamics of this patient and will it help him um, to reduce the shunting? So, so if we think about the, you know, uh, if, if we just dig a little bit deep, we were talking about, uh, about how to quantitate the amount, the A. Do we do that invasively? Do we that, do that by MRI? Do we do that by echo? Should we do it by all three? I mean, the standard way to do it for congenital ASD is echo, right? We just look for RV volume over the state. So if you show that the right ventricle's volume is increasing uh, by RVAF fraction calculation, then that's the standard way. And in fact, if you remember the Corvia study with the hydrogenic ASD, they actually showed that there was a slight increase in right sided volume overloads in the device arm. So I think that's a easy, sensitive way to pick it up. Otherwise, we'll probably have to do invasive QPQS with oximeter. I was going to, Nick, just a quick one, because in fact, obviously, in procedurally, quite easy to do, you know, um, an, a mixed venous oxygen, saturation and, and arterial to get what right. the QPQS is procedurally. So I'd say invasively use that. But follow up, Echo is very good at doing QPQS um, as an assessment, and that would feel adequate. Okay. Um, how about the size? Should we be measuring this on TEE, on, on, on transthoracic? Um, transthoracic is very inaccurate. That's the problem. It's not specific. So to me, it's not just the size. It's actually the slit. Yeah. See, if you have a hole and you have a slit, if you have a round hole, it's probably going to contract into the size. But if you have a slit on one side of the septum, that becomes to me a problem. <coughs> that to actually get smaller is not going to be that straightforward. Yeah, right. maybe Jean. Is Jean there or did he leave? Okay, left. Jean's uh, just stepped out. I just saw him a second ago because he's seen all of these cases. He saw, you know, uh, and, and he's, he has in his mind how they all look, but a lot of them do look like slits. Mm. And I, I've been surprised about that. I thought we'd see like a big hole. But at the end of the case, most the of the time we see a slit. Yeah. So it's, it's hard to estimate the size, I find. Correct. You agree? Well, I do, and I think that's where, I mean, you know, if they're very large, that's different, like Xenon's cases, but I do think that the hemodynamic um, implication of the whole is actually got to be very important rather than the, what is just the size, because the size right. is potentially, unlike a congenital <coughs> defect, is going to be, you know, very different. Yeah, if, it, if, right. it, if it's a tear morphology, yeah, yeah, like yours, here, so it's, then you have to fix yeah. it, yeah. If there's a clear cut tear like that, then you have to fix it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, just for the uh, final few minutes remaining, just to go over some of the um, you know, high life clinical studies uh, that are ongoing. Um, there uh, is a current follow up that is expected for five years for uh, patients that have undergone this treatment already. Um, so we're looking at some, you know, longer term follow up um, and the studies that are ongoing are going to extend the number of patients to 120. Um, there is also um, the use of the uh, clarity valve. Uh, the clarity valve is a valve that is uh, lacking a skirt on the outflow portion on the ventricular portion. Uh, which is supposed to um, reduce the uh, screen failures for LVOT obstruction uh, so that flow can go through the cells. Um, and uh, that valve is currently being used in the United States, an early feasibility study, and will get its way to Australia and to uh, Europe. Um, we also, uh, and that is called, by the way, uh, the uh, high flow uh, study. Um, and uh, sometime in 2024, um, there is the uh, planning for a U.S. Uh, pivotal study. So um, just to uh, recap some of the uh, highlights of the session, we initially went over some of the clinical data. Um, and it's still very early phase. Um, we are uh, getting and accumulating data. Uh, and it looks encouraging. We are, you know, hitting some roadblocks once in a while, and I think this is normal. Uh, but I think the, um, the concept and the feasibility is definitely there. Um, you know, the looping initially in the first cases was very difficult. We have to admit, in the first 10 patients, we had no idea what we were doing. And just like the mitra clip, after you got an imaging protocol, the duration of the procedure and the ease of the procedure improved. And as Wolfgang and um, it was Wolfgang or Seibel said that I want to make this a fluoroscopic procedure, uh, but really about 90% or 95% of the procedure is fluoroscopic driven, 5 to 10% is echocardiographic driven. 
Um, the intermediate results at one year look very encouraging uh, with the valve in terms of MR reduction uh, and also the uh, more detailed results of the uh, stroke volume and, and cardiac output increases. Uh, hopefully some of the new valve designs, not only including the uh, high uh, clarity valve or um, the valve with, uh, without the skirt to reduce uh, the um, um, uh, screen failures for LVOT obstruction, but also there will be a larger valve uh, with a larger atrial brim uh, that will also attack the uh, second reason why we've been screening out so many patients. Uh, and of course, we will have uh, further studies ongoing, um, especially a, a, an IDE pivotal study in 2024. So thank you to the panel. Uh, thank you for everyone for being here on the uh, last day of London Valves and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.